turn now to something a little bit more serious. And prostate cancer is the leading cause of death among Australian men. But there's some new research that suggests we may be over-treating it. Five years ago, 69-year-old Jeff Huber was told he had prostate cancer. It's a dreaded word, cancer, and if you're told that your body has cancer, then the natural thing is to want to get it out. It was recommended that Jeff have his prostate removed, or else the cancer could grow and spread. But the surgery had serious side effects. The nerves had been damaged so much that I was impotent. And if that wasn't bad enough, afterwards, Jeff was told he didn't have cancer at all. I was devastated, absolutely devastated, and it took me a while to get over it. I should never have had the surgery. It should have been a watch and wait situation. I would have been still walking around for many, many years with a quality of life. 20,000 Australian men are diagnosed with prostate cancer each year. 15% of them will die from it. But for around 40% of men, a cancer diagnosis means watch and wait. We don't treat everybody we diagnose with prostate cancer. What you want to know is, do I have prostate cancer? Do I need treatment or can it be monitored? The standard test for prostate cancer is a blood test called a PSA. Australian urologists recommend a PSA test for men over 40, but not everyone agrees. PSA is not effective at diagnosing cancer. It's not effective at predicting how a cancer will behave even if it's diagnosed. This thing we call prostate cancer does not behave like a cancer for most men who have it. Because prostate cancer is unpredictable, many studies have now questioned the widespread use of PSA tests. A US task force recommended that they be avoided. I think that the US task force should hang its head in shame because the PSA test, which gets a lot of negative press, is actually a very good test if it's used in a judicious way. It's probably the best test in cancer that we have. Removing the prostate is the most effective treatment against prostate cancer, but it can cause impotence and incontinence. I'd rather deal with those problems and try and solve them and not die from prostate cancer because if you don't get treated when you have lethal prostate cancer, you're going to die from it. But for every 38 men that have their prostate removed, the surgery is only life-saving for one of them. The latest and best study ever done in prostate cancer shows that surgery does not work. Those that are destined to die of their cancer will still die of it, irrespective of what we do or when we pick it up. Despite questions over the effectiveness of surgery, when Paddy O'Sullivan was diagnosed with cancer, he opted to have his prostate removed. The first urologist, he just said, well, it has to come out. We hadn't realised that it had to be quite that radical. We had thought that we just do eight weeks of radiation and then somehow it magically goes away. Four months later, and Paddy has almost fully recovered. People say, how are you going? And I said, yeah, well, I'm pretty well ready for selection in the next team, whoever's picking it. But like 30% of surgery patients, Paddy has been left impotent, something both he and his wife have had to deal with. Our relationship wasn't defined by that in itself. You know, we've, we've been together 18 years. There's far more to our relationship. Who knows? It could have been 10 years down the track and it would have been well too late then. While thousands of men choose between a certain future with surgery and an uncertain future with cancer, the medical community remains divided. I would just tell men to only present if they have symptoms and otherwise not to go looking for this disease. My view is seen as heretical by some people, but I am a cancer specialist. I'm in the business of helping people and maintaining quality of life as well as length of survival. We've still got 3,000 men dying from prostate cancer. What are we going to do about it? Put our head in the sand? It's, it, there's compelling arguments on both sides of this one. It's a really difficult one. At the moment, the NH and MRC, which is sort of our overseeing Australian research board, are currently trying to come up with some guidelines either way because you can understand if you, let's say, Limo, you were in that position where you had to toss up between living a life with cancer or going through those risks, which one would you choose? I'd... Uh, I wouldn't like to take on those side effects. Mm. So I don't think I'd do I don't think I'd have the surgery. That's thing. You're talking about your manhood, sexual desire, you know, for a man, that would be so... You, don't, you seriously don't want that taken away from you. I wouldn't anyway. I'm sure everyone has different risk assessments, but I yeah. personally wouldn't opt for the surgery. And it really comes down to quality of life, I suppose, for people and, and making sure you're informed until mm. we really get on top of this and the research comes out that's definitive. It's asking as many questions as you so possibly can. you would rather possibly die from cancer then live with your family and friends impotent. Uh, yeah, but they, so if they test, if they say I'm potentially a risk, I would, I would think I'd take that chance. Yeah.
Now that, I mean, mind you, that's not the only side effect, but no. sure, I think sure. I would take that risk, yes. Well, it's certainly a tough one. This month is Blue September. You can buy these ribbons, the ones that the guys are wearing now, which raises awareness of prostate cancer. Check out the project website for all the details. A bit more still to come. We'll be back after this.